Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. So with me today is Barbara Cohn. She is an author and she also was a caregiver like me. She took care of her husband, Morris, for over a decade. Morris had younger onset Alzheimer's, as I suspect my mom did. And the name of her book is Calmer Waters. And so we're going to talk a little bit about Calmer Waters and why that's a really important book and what she recommends we do in this crazy pandemic time and for all times, actually. So thanks for joining me, Barbara. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. So why don't you tell me about your husband first? So my husband, Morris, died from younger onset Alzheimer's disease 10 years ago. And he was diagnosed just about the time he was turning 60 years old. I was 48 years old, which is very young for having to care for someone with Alzheimer's disease. And I suspected something was going on for a couple of years before he was diagnosed. And I begged him to go to a neurologist, but he refused. That sounds familiar. Yeah, because he thought everything was just fine. So the first big clue for me is when we went away for our 25th wedding anniversary to Spain. And he could not figure out the money exchange. And he was a financial guy. He was really smart. He memorized airplane schedules, train schedules. He ended up following me around like a puppy dog. Mm. So I knew there was something wrong. And then later when we came home, he started getting lost driving around. That happens. My mom got lost going to her nail salon and it was a less than, well, it was about a mile away. Well, she actually made it to the salon, but they got new owners. And so there was different signage and like different decorations and it confused her. So she went back home. Well, the real key to thinking there was something wrong, the, the ultimate one was when a friend called for directions to the high school where Morris attended in Denver because her son was taking the SAT there and he didn't have a clue. He grew up in Denver, he went to high school there. I got out a map, he couldn't read the map and then I really knew something was wrong. So to make a long story short, we went through the whole journey um, which was tragic, terrible. We had two kids, uh, one in college. Um, Actually, they were both in college when he was diagnosed. And I tried to keep it a secret from them for an entire year, which was really, really hard on me. I, I do not advise that. Don't keep it from your closest family. It just made it that much more stressful. Um, So, because of my background as a writer for manufacturers of nutritional supplements, I got him all on all the latest and greatest supplements that are supposed to support cognition. And I ordered Nemenda from Europe before it was FDA approved in this country. I didn't know that it was, hadn't been approved. I just assumed it had been around a long time. Well, it was approved um, after. So this is 20 years ago already I'm talking about. So I got him on that. Um, This is after the diagnosis. And and things did improve for a long time. Um, But, of course, unfortunately, can't stay that way forever. So I wrote this book, Calmer Waters, The Caregiver's Journey Through Alzheimer's and Dementia, um, to help other caregivers through their journey to reduce stress, feel happier, healthier, 
learn different ways to cope. And it's kind of ironic that you invited me to do this talk today because now that we're dealing with all the stress of this pandemic, um, this book is wonderful for everybody. Mm -hmm. For you and me, for everyone who is stressed, and that's probably 100%, 99% of the population. And I'm going to go through the book. I'll, I'll talk about why I'm saying that. So I was in a unique position, as I mentioned, to write this book because I have this background in nutrition. I have a certificate from the Bowman College of Nutrition and Culinary Arts. So I knew what, were, what some of the greatest silver bullets were. So this book is four chapters, or four sections. The first section deals with the spirituality of caregiving. And I invited um, some religious leaders to write essays. The second section is essays written by other caregivers. And I wanted to get other stories because as the saying goes, once you've seen one Alzheimer's patient, you've seen one. Yep. Everyone's story is a little bit different, and every caregiver's story is different for dealing with the world that's been turned upside down. No kidding. It's affecting people with dementia and Alzheimer's very negatively, I believe. That's, that's what I'm hearing from people that are reaching out. You mean right now? Yes. Yeah. It's the lack of, well, the cha dramatic change in routine, the lack of socializing with other people. You know, I've got a friend whose dad go, went to a, you know, social day program that's been closed and she thinks he's depressed, which is probably true. And she's, she's struggling. He's struggling. I just got a message that their VA caregiver can come back. I don't, they have two. And one of them, a family member got sick, so the caregiver had to self-quarantine away from him just in case. So she had a couple weeks there that were real rough, <laughs> but it's getting better. But yeah, she's really worried about her dad and other people have reached out and it's just, they think they're suspecting and they're probably correct that their family members are declining faster because of this complete upending of our world. I'm sure. It's a really dangerous time to be in a memory care home today. Yeah, these guys are taking care of their family members at home. My mom's care community, we're in California. 12, 14, I think it was, oh yeah, it was um, the 16th of March was the last time I saw her for two weeks because they were, they basically closed the entire community to visitors completely. And, but they were kind they knew mom was not doing well. They said, hmm, you probably should come see her. They were hoping that my being there would help her, but she hadn't eaten for 24 hours at that point. And so we, we were literally 24 hours from the end when I went and saw her. And then they let, well, they didn't let, but <laughs> 10 of us ended up in the community, <laughs> right? She passed away before we all got there, but it, it hadn't been very long. And the executive director was very generous because he didn't want us there and 10 of us was a problem, <laughs> but you know, we all left quietly and respectfully and, and I don't think only one person in our entire group had any kind of risk factors for being a carrier and she was wearing a mask. It was my mom's aunt or my mom's aunt, my aunt, mom's sister. So they're doing a really good job, but it was not easy. Those two weeks I couldn't go at all because she needed me and I wanted to make sure that she remembered me. I was very concerned that she would forget me completely and then not trust me. And she was already getting really combative. And I thought, well, if you don't trust me and you don't remember me at all, that's going to be a huge problem going forward. So thankfully I don't have to deal with that. And they were really kind. You know, we, mom didn't, technically die alone. Family saw her before and after. So it's not the sad, sad stories that you've heard on the news. Other people whose family members have passed away and they still can't see them. 
but yeah, it is a really tough time and I would not want to be in a memory care residence as a worker right now. Cause it's, you know, you don't get to see the family, you know, their routines are upended. It's stressful. No, it's not a good it, thing. It's a really, really tough time for everybody. And I'm so sorry you had to go through that. And my condolences to you. Thank you. It could have been a lot worse. They could have not called the day before. Well, the, they called me the Sunday before she passed away and I went Monday morning. And so I got to say all the important things before she left. My sisters and my niece saw her that night. So I'm assuming they got to say all the important things before mom left. And then you know, it was better for mom. It was, it was rough. And I'm a little concerned it's going to be rough because I couldn't clean out her room. Her stuff's just all still sitting there. So whenever this is over, <laughs> I get to go do that. <laughs> Maybe it'll be easier in two months or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> Let's hope so. So I'd like to talk about the biggest section of my book. Um, and it's the main reason I wrote the book, to help other people. And it's got 20 chapters on healing modalities that you can use for yourself and or with your care partner. So the, all these things are great for doing right now. And in fact, I, I looked at, through the book earlier today and saw that I'm doing a lot of them for myself. And I just want to talk about some of the favorite ones. That sounds great. So aromatherapy. Did you ever use that with your mom? No, we actually, my sister really wanted to, um, what is it? Not dispense is not quite the right word, but she wanted to do the essential oils that are, is essentially evaporated in water. Mm -hmm. So it required somebody to deal with the apparatus to do that. And we weren't sure how to make that happen on a regular basis, even though both of us went every week. You know, when we went different days, it just didn't seem like something she could make work. But I do have to say, my husband and I have gotten back on our bikes. Cycling really helps me get rid of negative feelings and emotions. So obviously this is a really good time to be doing that. And the other day as we're riding, the sun is really warm. It's still quite breezy. So that keeps the temperature down and we ride past bushes, you know, um, orange trees in bloom and the one bush that's right out front, my front door. And now it's name is going to slip my mind. <laughs> it's um, honeysuckle. That sounds kind of right. But the scent is just, Ah, just it smells so wonderful. And it really, when you like take in a big nose full, it's just, I don't know, it does something, does something positive to me. So aromatherapy is definitely good. Well, this was one of the things that I used with my husband that worked instantly for reducing his anxiety. Um, this is a fabulous chapter in the book written by a renowned aromatherapist, Lorraine Pounds, and she goes through all the different categories of scents, florals and citrus, um, and talks about how to use them to alleviate different symptoms like stress, depression, uh, low appetite, anxiety. So when my husband was reacting to certain stimuli in, in the environment and he would get anxious. I used a wall plug-in mm -hmm. and you can put some drops on a little piece of felt and it diffuses the, the molecules in the air and it goes right to the olfactory centers of the brain and it, it would calm them down so uh, probably most people are familiar with lavender oil. That's the most common one that's used to relieve anxiety and, and calm people down. And that's also wonderful to use on your pillow. Mm -hmm. If you're having trouble sleeping at night, you can just spritz a little bit on the pillow or on the sheets. You can also spritz some on a 
handkerchief and tuck it into somebody's pocket so that they always have that aroma. Well, at least for a while. But that's a really wonderful way to just uplift the mood and to calm things down. And exercise, of course. You notice when you're bicycling, it's so important, especially now when we're in lockdown, many of us are in isolation, to at least get out and walk every day for 20 minutes at least when the weather is permitting. And if you can't get outside, try to do something inside. And there's so many great free classes online right now that are streaming. Mm -hmm. Yoga, Zumba, dance, whatever you like. So what else? There's a chapter on art projects written by an art therapist. And these, these little art projects are so simple that you can do them with somebody with dementia. And so many times the person with dementia is told, no, you can't do this, you can't do that. But create, creating art is a wonderful way of uplifting them and, and giving them a sense of pride and accomplishment. What else? Breathing. Breathing. That's important. Um, I've been doing a lot of breathing exercises since this pandemic hit. Um, first of all, to strengthen the lungs. And when you do breathing exercises, and, and I'll actually teach you one. Okay. Um, it's called pranayama, and it's from India. It goes along with meditation and yoga. So you just sit comfortably. You can close your eyes. Put your thumb on one nostril, breathe in with the other nostril, and then put your third or fourth finger on the other nostril and breathe out. And it's alternating breath. It's, it's interesting. So you're breathing in one nostril, out the other, in the other nostril, out the other. And not only does it calm us down, but it really is working the lungs and it's making them stronger. That's definitely important regardless, regardless of this pandemic. You know, you need strong lungs just for daily living. Right, but this is also a, a wonderful technique for just calming us down and making us feel more um, in, in our body instead of crazed with always, anxiety. Always, sorry, I always find when I find myself getting wound up, like when my mom was in the hospital, and I'm sure you know how hospitals are. They're not super easy to deal with. And I was just getting wound up, just stopping and just taking the, like three or four really deep breaths in through the nose, out through the mouth, <clears throat> really helped, like kind of calm me down, center me so I could be like, okay, now, you know, going off the edge is not going to help anything. It's not going to get anything accomplished. It'll make it all worse. What do I need to do? <sighs> okay. Boom. Go forward. Right. Um, so another great healing modality for everybody is the use of humor yeah <laughs> and i know people are watching a lot of tv and movies and if you don't feel like spending a whole hour it's good to just get on youtube and watch some funny videos of cats and babies just something to make us laugh because laughter is the greatest medicine of all and get on the the telephone and talk to a friend and reminisce about the crazy things you did when you were kids. <laughs> That's a good one. So it's a, it's a good thing to do now. It's a good thing to do if you're a caregiver to uplift your mood. And I just want to remind people when you're caregiving for somebody with Alzheimer's, it's, it's really good to have a sense of humor. And I'll give you a little anecdote. My husband 
toward the end of his illness, forgot what to do with a sandwich. Mm -hmm. My mom got like that. Yeah. So one day I handed him a chicken salad sandwich and he looked at it and he said, what is this? And I said, chicken salad. And he took it and threw it across the table and said, this chicken is dead. And I, I just laughed and laughed and laughed. And he ended up laughing too, because laughter is contagious. And it's not as though we're laughing at them when they come out with these crazy things, but we're laughing with them. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind. I have a funny anecdote. Now my mom passed away March 31st, and I think this was February 10th. It was either the 10th or the 17th. We were chatting and she was, she was very, very verbal. And people that didn't know better or didn't know her would have not a lot of clues that she was so advanced stages of Alzheimer's because it sounded like it made sense, but it was bits and pieces of different eras of history and I don't know, some fantasy. It never made any sense, but she was talking this one day about how her brothers, she's the oldest of four. She, I, I hate to say this out loud, but I think she forgot her sister and her sister went and visited as frequently as she could. So that's sad. But she was talking about how her brothers are normal people now. And I said, Oh, your brothers are normal people now. And she goes, yeah. And then she starts talking about something totally, you know, totally different topic. And I thought, huh, wonder what her brothers were before they were normal people. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> I could have a little internal chuckle, which, which helped because for me, it was very difficult she, you know, she's talking about her brothers, which sometimes she thought her brothers were her sons. One time she told me she didn't have daughters. She had sons. It's like, no, you had daughters, but that's okay. I'm not going to correct you. <laughs> it's just like, I'm sitting right here. I'm pretty sure you had at least one. <laughs> and, you know, then she's off talking about some other lady. And, so, you know, and it's just, if she, if I tried to figure out what she was saying and I got that perplexed look on my face, that would really upset her. She interpreted that confusion on my face as anger or something negative. So I had to learn and it was really hard because she'd say something and, and it's almost an automatic reflex to be like, what? Huh? And I know this is audio for most people. So that's a, a, a huh face. And so I had to learn not to do that because it could immediately take a nice wacky conversation into anger and not a nice conversation. So it was nice to have that internal chuckle about my uncles being normal people. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> I was like, I still wish I could ask her what they were before they were normal people. <laughs> so I want to go through some other important things that I think everybody should be aware of now. Um, one of which is making sure you're hydrated. Mm-hmm because um, the lungs are actually about 83% water and the brain is, I think, about 60% water. It's interesting or the lungs are more water. Fat. Yeah, they're very spongy and they hold a lot of water. Um, but our brains depend on water to work well. And I want to tell you a little story about my mom who died um, almost three years ago, and she was in a senior community in her own apartment, but she had a full, full, two full-time aides around the clock because she had broken her hip and she couldn't walk anymore, and she had a severe stroke. Um, she had very mild dementia. She got a lot of UTIs. She ended up in the hospital with severe dehydration, and a UTI, and a psychiatrist called me and said, your mom is in full-blown dementia. And I said, no, she's not. I just talked to her the other day. She was fine. Well, she ended up being severely hydrated. And after she got her IV fluids, after a couple days, her mind was just fine. So that's just an example of how when the brain is dehydrated, we can show signs of dementia. 
And now with this pandemic, it's just more important than ever that we really have to stay hydrated. So just make sure you're drinking lots of good water. Teas are good. Watch the caffeine because caffeine um, is actually dehydrating. We don't want to get too hyper during this. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, all I drink is tea and water. Good. And, uh, you know, you've, you've heard it before. Soda, soft drinks are not good for you. Nope. My mom used to drink two liters of Diet Coke a day. Wow. Like, yuck. Well, um, so another thing I want to talk about is the importance of good sleep hygiene. When we're sleeping, it gives the brain um, a chance to actually clean itself of the amyloid plaque that builds up in the, in the Alzheimer's brain. So besides needing our sleep to rejuvenate and restore everything else that's going on in our body, it's really important to the brain. I know a lot of people are having trouble now sleeping because they're worried about their finances, about losing their jobs, about taking care of their parents, about not being able to visit their parents or spouses or other relative in a memory care home. So there are things that we could do to help us sleep better. Number one, turn off all your electrical devices at least an hour before. And when this first thing broke, um, I found myself glued to the news like most people. I was watching it way up until right before bed and it was definitely affecting my dreams. I was having really weird dreams. So just remember, um, normal sleep um, recommendations. Don't watch the news right before bed. Um, we can have some protein right before bed, like cottage cheese or a piece of cheese or um, even popcorn, is, which is what I like. Um, peanut butter on a cracker, some kind of carbohydrate, bananas are good. And that way there won't be um, a drop in our blood sugar during the middle of the night, which is often the reason why people wake up in the middle of the night because mm. their blood sugar drops. And I'm not talking about having to go to the bathroom. That's a whole nother issue. That's my issue. <laughs> um, so in that case, try not to drink right before bed. I know if I do, then I get up in the middle of the night. Yeah, I try to cut it off at about 8.30, but now it's warmer, and I don't know. Well, I live in California, and it's really dry, and so I find I have, you know, the water bottle by the bed. You know, I get up, I do what I need to do, and I go back to sleep pretty quickly, but I also have a technique. I listen to, I listen to podcasts because the talking, the melodic rhythm of speaking is very, I mean, seriously, I'm asleep in two or three minutes, which never, ever happens. If I wake up and I don't, like I just say, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna turn that one on. I wanna listen to that and actually be awake for it. I can lay there for half hour, 45 minutes or more. So I don't do that. I just, I'll just listen to it again. <laughs> if I have to listen to it four times, actually hear it, it's fine. But that's yeah. my. Well, I'm glad you found something that works. There are a lot of apps, too, mm -hmm. that have water music, meditative music, um, chimes are nice. I actually found just recently, because I get a little, when I'm editing, you know, when I'm listening to my own podcast to edit and make sure they're all the way they need to be to release, obviously can't listen to music or podcasts because that would just confuse my poor brain. And this one day, for whatever reason, I was like, I just don't want to sit here and listen just to this. And I went into the Apple iTunes. We have the subscription. And it was in the moods, and it had, like, nature sounds. And that's what it was, was, like, water and birds chirping and rain. And it was, and I just had it on really low volume in the background. And I was like, that's really nice. And so I need to make sure to add that to my playlists. 
It's interesting now when I'm watching TV, um, every once in a while a commercial will come on and they'll just play rain music. Mm -hmm. That's a commercial for Calm. I think that's the app my husband's been using. Right. Just to relax the viewers. I think it's really nice. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to advertise the app, too. Mm -hmm. And as a reminder, what I talked about earlier, um, lavender oil is, is good for sleep. Taking um, a hot Epsom salt bath is a wonderful way to relax. Put on some music, light some candles, get into the bath and just unwind. And our body, we actually absorb some of the magnesium and the Epsom salt. And magnesium is one of the anti-stress minerals. Mm. And it, it also helps us sleep. If you can tolerate drinking milk, warm milk with a little bit of honey and some Indian spices like cumin, cloves, um, cardamom, turmeric. Any of those spices are very relaxing to drink. Um, it's like a golden latte. If hmm. you've ever had one of those. No, I have not. But the key is to, to heat the milk first. And then it's easy to absorb the calcium, which also aids in helping us sleep. Well, it's interesting. In my weight loss journey, one of the recommendations was if you are hungry close to bedtime, was to have like a breakfast food. So like an egg or a bowl of cereal. So it's the protein. And I generally like cereal because it's, it's just sweet enough with the milk and everything that you kind of get that dessert kind of hit to the brain. My mm -hmm. whole family, well, my mom's side of the family all has a genetic sweet tooth that the listeners all well know about. And I think, I'm wondering, I might just try the, this golden latte. That sounds really good. Is it kind of making me kind of desiring it right now and it's lunchtime or was. <laughs> Yeah, I I actually had the recipe. I must have taken it downstairs, but well, if you um, if you send that to me, I will include it in the show notes because that sounds really good. Actually, okay, I will. I'll send you that recipe. So as long as you brought up breakfast, that was the next item on my list I wanted to talk about. So important to have a good breakfast, especially if you're caregiving at home. So what happens when we're caregivers is we get into this fight or flight um, chronic stress that can last for a decade. It lasted for me for an entire decade. And after my husband died, I realized I haven't been breathing properly. I ended up with other health issues, but um, when you're in a chronic stress situation, and, and now I would say almost everybody is in a now definitely. stress situation, the adrenal glands, um, they're the little walnut-shaped glands that sit on top of your kidneys, get stuck in the on position. So they're continually continuously pumping out cortisol, which is the stress hormone. So when we're pumping out cortisol, that can keep us up at night. We get into this vicious cycle of not being able to sleep, and then um, we wake up in the morning. Um, if we don't eat a good breakfast to bring up our low blood sugar and grab something that's sweet, like a donut or an over-sugared coffee or a fancy latte drink. It'll spike the blood sugar, but then an hour or two later, it will crash again. And then you'll want a nap. So, and, and it really affects the mood. It makes us impatient and irritable. So the best way to fix that is to eat a breakfast with protein. Actually, it's important to eat some protein with every meal because that stabilizes the mood. 
So I just want to mention neurotransmitters. Okay. And then I'll, I'll get back to the breakfast. Um, neurotransmitters are the chemicals in the brain that communicate with the rest of the body. Um, and they control everything from our ability to breathe, our ability to digest food, for the heart to beat, as well as mood, um, sexuality. Um, so we want to try to support our neurotransmitters. And the best way to do that is by eating a good, healthy diet that contains proteins and carbohydrates and healthy fats and liquids. Um, so for breakfast, for instance, probably cornflakes, banana, and milk is the most common breakfast in America, but it doesn't really give us enough protein. Mm -mm. So I know I've been having a little bit of an issue keeping enough eggs in the house during this pandemic. Um, and I'm not going to the grocery store at all. I am totally socially isolated. So I have to depend on Instacart for doing my shopping. And sometimes they bring me what I want. And sometimes they don't. So this past delivery, I did not get all the eggs I wanted. Um, but it's a, a really good breakfast. Would be eggs and some type of greens. I know it takes a little bit getting used to to have greens for breakfast, but we're supposed to get five to seven fruits and or, and or vegetables a day. So if you get them in the morning, at least you've got something in you. So my favorite breakfast is sautéed kale or Swiss chard with eggs and a side of beans. Beans are great for um, protein and for fiber. Mm -hmm. And then if you want, you could add a little bit of avocado for healthy fat. Avocado is one of the best sources of fat that we have. And unfortunately, this Californian doesn't like avocado. <laughs> well, I don't either. I wish I did, but I can still recommend it. I've tried. And we even had a tree in our old house that um, it actually was, um, well, the avocados that ripened like in December. It was, I forgot what variety it was, but I'm going to, we've had to, we need to switch up some of our breakfast routine just because I'm bored to tears. My husband makes breakfast and each day of the week has its own specific breakfast. So we have seven different breakfasts, but they're all kind of similar. So I'm going to, I'm going to suggest the, the eggs and the, um, if you don't like kale and I don't think I've tried Swiss chard, um, collard yeah, greens oh, are, okay. they're, they're like a more tender version of kale. Cause being in Northern California, I had like collard greens. That's not something we eat up here. And I tried it through a blue apron meal and it was like, Oh, we actually like this better than the kale just because it wasn't quite as fibrous. And it just, like I said, it was like a little bit more delicate version of kale, same basic flavor. And so, yeah, maybe toss in a little bit of onion. That'll be good. Yeah, definitely. I use onions with everything I make. So onions, mushrooms, peppers, that's another favorite of mine. Maybe a little sprinkle of cheese, if you have cheese. Um, also oatmeal. I mean, grains are wonderful for breakfast. You can add some yogurt, some nuts, flax seed, if you have that. You might bake with that. It makes a good egg substitute in baking. Probably not a good egg substitute for eating, though. What's that? Flaxseed meal. You mix oh, um, mm -hmm. one part flaxseed meal to two parts water, and it's an egg substitute. Oh, I didn't so, know that. Or no, is it three parts water? It's two tablespoons of flaxseed meal and six tablespoons of water, so that's one to three. I can do math. Oh. And that's what I put in a lot of my baked goods. Years and years ago, I tripped over a vegan pumpkin bread recipe. I'm by no means vegan or vegetarian. We do 
eat vegetarian meals, but vegan is not going to happen in this household. <laughs> and this was the best pumpkin bread I've ever eaten. And it's, and there's no dairy, there's no eggs, there's none of that, you know, no butter. So it's, you know, it's basically flaxseed meal and whole grain flour, whole wheat flour and pumpkin, obviously. And then I add like zest of orange and I must have some sugar in it, but it, it was delicious. And I would give it to people and they'd be like, oh my gosh, this is the best pumpkin bread I've ever had. And I'm like, oh, it's vegan. And they'd be like, what? Then I would tell them that basically it was really healthy for, you know, like a desserty kind of bread. And they'd be like, oh, good. And they'd have like another slice. Oh, great. I'll, I'll try that. I'll try to remember to send you that recipe. And then I created a chocolate spice bread. I used the one that's basically the Starbucks knockoff recipe, which called for like, I don't know, two to four sticks of butter. It was a lot of butter. Oh. Um, it did make two loaves, but it still it was a lot of butter. So I I basically kept playing. It's like kitchen chemistry until I I'm like, okay, I've got this one recipe that doesn't use eggs or butter or oil or any of this stuff. And this other recipe that uses all of that stuff, you know, it's just it's almost you can almost see the artery clogging just by reading it. And so I kept experimenting until I got to a point where it tasted really good and it was much healthier. What I use for a butter replacement or at least partial butter replacement is silken tofu. Oh, okay. I'll I mean, check that. and I don't, not a tofu person either. It's like, I know I'm from Northern California, don't like avocado mushrooms or tofu. <laughs> I don't know what part of California I'm supposed to be from, but it is really good. And, you know, when you reduce the sugar and you reduce the fat, you know, and you still treat it like a dessert, you're doing, you know, you're, you're, like I said, genetic sweet tooth, you're, you're pleasing the sweet tooth, but you're not putting a lot of garbage in. And that's how I bake. So I will send you that one too. So you could send me the, the golden latte. Oh yeah. The latte. I'm like, we were talking about breakfast, but that wasn't it. <laughs> yeah. Send me that. We'll share. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Um, so I wanted to get back to neurotransmitters a little bit, and I'm going to have to read some of the stuff because I can't keep it all in my head all the time. That's understandable. Um, so serotonin, everybody's heard about serotonin, which is the, the happy neurotransmitter. And it's estimated that 86% of Americans are deficient in this. Poor diet, stress, which we all have now, protein deficiency, poor digestion, poor blood sugar control, drugs, prescription and recreational, alcohol and caffeine can deplete neurotransmitters. So serotonin is important for keeping an upbeat, positive mood. It's important for our sleep, our concentration, our weight. And when we're deficient, it can cause imbalances. It's also important for depression and anxiety. So foods that enhance serotonin are salmon, soy, turkey, cheese, eggs, spinach, cottage cheese, nuts, milk, avocado meat and chocolate um Yay so for the chocolate <laughs> yeah chocolate that's the the most important one i wanted to talk about today because we're all feeling stress and also um gaba too many carbs and refined foods deplete gaba and that's really important for helping you fall asleep no so we talked a little bit about sleep and chocolate, as long as you don't have too much and stick with really dark chocolate, it's known for its ability to increase our feeling of calmness. It increases serotonin, and it stimu stimulates your brain cells to release dopamine, which is another neurotransmitter. I have a quick story on chocolate 
and calming. 10 years ago, I went on a huge weight loss journey to lose 100 pounds, which I did. I've kept most of it off. Oh, so good for you. I've, I have broken the trend, turning 50 and going through a lot of stress three years ago and caregiving with my mom and <sighs> too much stress in, in, this, in the stuff that happens after ladies turn 50. Put on a couple more than I want, but now I'm finding it a little easier to to take it off. I'm not weighing myself and not really wearing real pants right now either. So, <laughs> it's, but it, I feel so much better because I've been exercising and I think the stress because she's gone is greatly diminished. But 10 years ago, it was like right around 9-11, I have my business bank account got hacked into, like literally they hacked into it. They changed the password, they ordered checks, and then they ordered something, or they bought something out of state, and that's what flagged the bank. And I'm not a huge fan of banks. They wanted to basically close this account, like immediately, just slam it closed. And I'm like, we can't do that. There's all these payments that come out weekly, and I'm going to have to, you know, I need a new debit card so I can, you know, there's just a lot of stress about that. And they weren't being really understanding or really flexible. And my immediate instinct, I was so frustrated. And my husband normally deals with banks because he used to work in the banking industry for 20 years. So he can speak their language. Whereas I just, I just lose my cool way too quickly. So that's usually how we divide up some responsibilities in this, this house, but he wasn't around and I was trying to deal with it because it was needed to be dealt with immediately. And I remember getting off the phone and I had this overwhelming urge to literally lay on the couch and suck on a Hershey bar like a pacifier. I'm like, I am not doing that to myself. I know that's stress. That's not going to make me feel better. I just think it'll make me feel better. But my, it, it was like serious battle, good versus e evil in my head. And the way I lost the 100 pounds was I um, cut fat grams way, 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 way low. It was most people can't do that. And it's the only thing that's worked for me. I've tried everything else. So I'm looking in the fridge. We had raspberries. I'm like, raspberries are good and they're sweet. That might help. And then I looked at the bottle of Hershey's syrup, which is pretty much sugar, but it was also zero fat and it's dark chocolate. And I put like less, about a tablespoon of Hershey's syrup on about two thirds of a cup of raspberries and ate them slowly. And it was just like, ah, I could deal with the bank again. And it was, you know, minimal calories, no fat or a tiny bit because there's actually a little bit in the raspberries. And it just, it's like there are solutions to stress eating that are much better for you because obviously raspberries are much better for your brain than laying on the couch crying and sucking on a Hershey bar. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably even better frozen. That could be. These were fresh and organic because it was, you know, the end of the summer. And they're just, they've got fiber in them. They're sweet. They're juicy. You know, just a little, it might not even been a tablespoon of chocolate, but it was just, just that little kick of chocolate on them just made them into this wonderful dessert. And it made me happy and it made me feel like I could deal with the bank again, which was important. Good. Yeah. Berries are the best fruit we can eat. And we've uh, been eating a lot of blackberries, raspberries, strawberry combination. And it's, you know, right now it's April 23rd. So the strawberries are coming. They're not quite that great yet. So another month ish, maybe they'll be really good. And so we're, we're, we're eating, we're doing definitely berries every morning with breakfast. We did have some struggles with getting fresh fruit from our grocery store because there was somebody that in the fresh, uh, fresh perishable department. So the dairy, the produce, the eggs, which I know is dairy, they died and died, warehouse worker died from COVID and they were trying to kind of keep it under wraps. Oh, no. So we actually had to switch to other grocery stores, which now is forcing us to go to different ones because like the Food Max and the Winco's don't have like deli departments or they're not, they're not the same as a Safeway. So it does, you know, you end up driving around a little bit more because the food chain is not broken, but it's dented pretty big. Mm -hmm. And it's scary because it's like, please don't buy produce from Safeway right now. <laughs> Just well, fortunately, I live in um, it was an all agricultural town, 
and then the suburbs grew up around it and I call it the agriburb so we have lots of you pick farms and and farm stands and you know all of those will be coming to life not as hundred percent as they used to but they're all they're all gonna still sell stuff on this you know their farm stands so we'll have a lot of fresh stuff that we don't have to get from a grocery store we get it very local Okay, um, I would like to talk about the MIND diet. Yes, that's a very good one. So I went down to the Anschutz Medical Center a couple of years ago, and there was a panel of neuroscientists who all work on Alzheimer's disease. And one of the presentations was on the MIND diet, which is a combination of the Mediterranean and the DASH diet. And they're finding that people who stick to this diet um, pretty well reduce their risk of Alzheimer's by 53%. Those who stick to it moderately well reduce their risk by 35%. So I just want to tell you a little bit about it. How does it differ from the Mediterranean diet? Well, it's pretty similar. On a daily basis, you eat at least three servings of whole grains, a salad, and another vegetable. Um, And they recommend that you can drink a glass of wine. But the researchers at this symposium said, if you have not been drinking wine up to this point, please do not start. It's not a reason to start um, because the jury is still out on whether a little alcohol consumption is better for your brain than none at all. Um, So they also suggest that you should snack on nuts, and that's just a small, small handful because they are full of fat, and we do need fat, but we don't want to eat in excess. And every other day, eat half a cup of beans. At least twice a week eat poultry and a half cup serving of berries. And blueberries are best, raspberries are great. And eat fish at least weekly. Olive oil is the preferred cooking oil. So the main way um, it differs from the Mediterranean diet is they don't like dairy at all. No to little cheese at all. The Mediterranean diet is more forgiving. You can eat some feta cheese. Um, I think also the Mediterranean diet includes more fish. But it's basically just an overall good diet with lots of fruit and vegetables, nuts, healthy oils, olive oil, and um, oh, and they don't like any sugar at all. Oops, there's where I fall off the wagon. <laughs> uh, that, that's tough. Tough for most people not to have any sweets at all. But if you are going to have some, it's good to have a little bit of cho- dark chocolate. And people are just crazed right now about baking. I find that funny how many people are like getting into sourdough baking, which my daughter did, but that's because she's wanted to perfect making sourdough bread for a while and she didn't really have the time while she was working and now she does. So, and now okay. she has a routine for making the dough one day and making the bread the next day because it has to ferment overnight. Baking is good therapy. You know, I've always baked as soon as I hear about someone who's died close to me. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse Bless me. you. Allergy season. Yep. Um, my first inclination is to bake and it's very therapeutic i bake a lot on the weekends and i i have found that you can cut the sugar but like when they say packed brown sugar you don't have to pack it and if it's three-fourths of a cup make it three-fourths of a scant cup or you can cut it back a little bit you got to be careful not to change the wet dry volume ratio much and then use the silken tofu in place of half of the butter. Your friends and family will never know that you've like healthified the cookies a little bit. 
That's what I do. Because like I said, I have a genetic sweet tooth and I've had nutritionists and trainers just say, just go cold turkey. And my family literally, they they get a horror expression on their face and they're like, nope, no, 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 no. Don't do that. (laughs) She will kill somebody if she tries that. And the kind of taking one half step back on the mind diet, the personal trainer that helped guide me through the weight loss, she always liked to say, you want to eat the rainbow, all the different colors and flavors and textures. And it's more interesting when you eat like that. So, right, right. Thanks for mentioning that. So, when I bake, I also cut way back on the sugar. I usually cut it by half and I use coconut sugar because when you eat something with coconut sugar, it doesn't make you crave more and more sugar. Somehow it just cuts that, and it's a much healthier sugar. I'm going to give that a try. I use molasses a lot in the chocolate baking. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's much better, but I do. It's better. I think it's less processed than white sugar. Yeah, and it's always important to use organic sugar because regular white sugar, is it's got chemicals in it. They bleach it. And who knows what else they spray on the cane stalks. But it's not good. It's not good for us. Probably not. Um, so did you want to ask me anything about my experience as a caregiver or my book? Did you use a lot of these modalities while you were caregiving? I did. I used a lot of them. Um, I've included aromatherapy in the book, which we used acupuncture we used, meditation, yoga. My husband was able to do yoga for a while. Um, we used, oh, music. He, he would walk around with a headset all day lis- listening to music, and I think it was a godsend for him. He I've heard that. loved, loved it. Um, he lived in a memory care home the last two years of his life, and he cheered everybody up, all the caregivers, um, and then they got to know his music and they'd play it for the other residents. Dance, dance still is really important in my life, and I, I write, there's a whole chapter in the book about dance. I'm using it now. I used it then. The memory care home would have jazz musicians come in once in a while and we'd have dances there. Um, So now you can get dance parties online and stream them. And, you know, no one's watching you, so you can dance as crazy as you want. Um, It's good exercise. It makes you happy. So there's a lot of good components to dancing. And being silly, I find sometimes, like we were walking the dogs and the kids have traced a hopscotch on the trail. And thankfully... It must have been bigger kids because the boxes are pretty big. <laughs> Sometimes they're child-sized feet. And, you know, I just, oh, look, hopscotch, doink, 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 and hop along, and the dog's looking at me like, what are we doing? And my husband's like, what are you doing? I'm like, this is fun. You know, and it's just, it, it raises your heart rate a little bit because you're jumping, and then, you know, it's like, what, eight jumps, and then you're done, so it's not, not too horrible, but it just kind of gives you that little spark of joy that we need to spark as often as we can yeah especially now but always and when you're caregiving even not in a pandemic so there's a chapter in my book written by dr ed bowman who's the president founder of the bowman college in nutrition and he writes about different herbs that we can use oh good i'm about to plant a garden so (laughs) Yeah, because there's a whole class of herbs called nervines that also calm us down, which are good for stress, Mm -hmm. and adaptogen herbs, which just help try to normalize the metabolism in the body and whatever we're experiencing that's out of whack. And which, which, which herbs would you recommend in that group? Um, well, I like Ayurvedic herbs mm-hmm. or some adaptogens, ashwagandha. Um, if you like, I could send you a list. 
That'd be great. I'll add that to the golden latte list. We're getting all hooked up today. <laughs> um, all right. So I do want to mention my blog. Oh, definitely. Please. I have a blog. Um, you could find it by just putting in um, Barbara Cohn and small letters.com. It's called the healthy caregiver blog. And I write, between two and three articles a month um, covering everything from how do you know it's Alzheimer's as opposed to another type of dementia. I cover nutrition. Um, a lot of the things I've talked about today, I just posted a couple of blogs about um, the art therapy projects, horticulture therapy, um, how to work with your care partner on creating a little garden that can stimulate memories. Um, there's a chapter in the book on pet therapy. I, I go through and just post everything of dealing with Alzheimer's and caregiving, ranging from nutrition to with the, what is the latest and greatest study on Alzheimer's, different diets. So it's barbacone.com. And, and also my book um, is available online from Barnes & Noble, Target, Walmart, um, Amazon. I noticed only has one copy left. Um, but the other outlets all should be able to get it quickly. So the blog and the maybe I'll link your bar, the Barnes and Noble link this time. I usually link Amazon because that's what people like, but I'll I'll make sure the book is linked and the blog is linked in the show notes. So they're a hot link. People can just scroll down, tap on it, and go right to the blog when we're done talking here. Or buy okay. the book or do both. Great. And I you know, I'm I'm happy to talk to people if you have any questions. Um, my email is on my blog and on the back page of my book, um, it's healthwriter1, numeral1, at gmail.com. So if you have any questions at all, I'm here to help support caregivers. H having gone through this journey myself, I felt like you know, it just made sense. I didn't want to go through this whole experience for naught. I came out the other end um, pretty healthy, I'm happy, and I'm, I want to help other people. Well, that's how I feel also. I started the podcast to help inform people, and then it shifted a little bit because I realized there was a lot more I didn't know, and so I started reaching out to a lot more people, and I learned a ton. I wish I'd learned a lot of it much earlier in my mom's disease, but having not learned it earlier, I can see kind of where we went wrong. I know a lot of people say, well, you never, you did your best. It wasn't wrong, but I don't know any other way to put that. And so I just, I'm considering myself a caregiver to caregivers now. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.